But we're told that, you know, we're told we're all trained that things used to be so much better back, you know, a while ago when you could talk to your neighbors. And, and here you are in, in the washes out in the middle of nowhere. Just walking up and talking to people, introducing myself and saying, this is what I do. And the moment they hear socks, whew, the smile on their face is just all. Oh. Tom, nice to meet Jason, you. Jason, nice to meet yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been great. I, I was like, okay, this will be fun. How long have you been the sock man? Four years. Four years. Okay. I do know that you're a retired. I'm a retired special ed teacher. I taught for 30 years. I mostly did autism. Oh, okay. So, oh, that, wow. I love that population. Everybody just, you know, it's communicating with them people like well you can't really communicate with them yeah you can you have to learn how to ask how they know how to answer and it's once you learn that those kids are just so it's not about them conforming them to us it's about us conforming to the way that they naturally are yep. and once you learn that these kids are as good and as smart as anybody else it's wow amazing. otherwise what they're a bunch of trouble they well, yeah, they, you know, they have all their uh, tics, you know, some of them self-stim, some just uh, can't handle a lot of uh, a crowds. So they wear uh, hearing pro uh, hearing covers like they do at the airport. Uh, they just have a hard time communicating. That's one of the biggest things that they do. And then they, you know, they run around and just have a hard time sitting still once you get them active and involved. And, they know that they can trust you. It becomes a whole different world for you as a teacher. I just love that. It's like, wow. Once, once, once you were able to figure out how the individual was and adapt your ways and your ways of teaching, it just flowed really, really well. Yeah, it was awesome. That's cool. For 30 years. 30 years. And my daughter uh, is in her eighth year, and she does the same thing. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, that's great. I mean... Teaching is a hard and tough job. They say that teaching and policemen, two toughest jobs you can get. Well, I believe that, but a lot of people always say, you know, it's like, well, I went to school, I can teach. I said, come into my classroom anytime you want. <laughs> have you seen a lot of kids after they've grown up? I have not. Um, I have had a few, maybe two or three that have come back and said I really made them who they were, that, you know, who they are today. They were like, without you, I could have gone in a whole different direction. But now you've totally changed gears and you're doing something totally different and on a voluntary level, you fund this all yourself for the most I do part? have this, I'm called the Sockman Group and everybody asks, well, what's the group mean? And it's, I have about 400 people that follow me that have joined my group and they help me with finances, socks. Um, they've really stepped up and done, you know, when Christmas comes, I get boxes instead of uh, presents. You know, it's like, I just want socks. Boom, there they are. Wow. My family does it. My family is very involved with no matter what, I get socks <laughs> for everything. And my mom now has talked to me. I have these, Eight women in a, uh, for what a lack of the word, um, I call it an old person, but that's not what it is anymore. But I have eight women knitting hats for me. So I. You mean personalized knitting? knitting. Oh, hats. God. <laughs> and it's been wonderful. I mean, I could, they gave me 200 of them when I left, and I'm out of them already. 200? I'll tell you what, um, those hats that people knit for you are way better than anything you can buy at a store. I've had people offer me money for mine, you know? <laughs> you know like, how much do you want for? Well, it was made for me. I can't give it up. 
Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And how did you get from the Chicago area out beyond that? I mean... Uh, I decided I had done going to Chicago a couple times, going under the bridges and, and help people, and out in the McHenry area. And then I decided, I started looking around, and I said, well, I haven't seen the United States. So I thought, you know, this would be an opportunity to be able to see things and help people. So and really experience it, because you could go in to L.A. and see all the sites, right. but you don't know anything about L.A. No. I mean, I mean, the, the people, people that, that live there don't, don't go, you know, they, they might go, go once or twice, but there's, yeah. So, and that's how it started. I worked my way down to uh, my first big trip as I went down to New Orleans for Day of the Dead Halloween. And I originally, I, everybody said it was a freak show, go to it. And I got so involved giving the socks out, going up and down the alleys. I never actually saw the parade or anything because I was so involved. <laughs> socks and I ran out of socks so I went to a Walgreens and uh, negotiated a deal with the manager and the manager was just awesome when she told me or when I told her what she did and what at, I did at, at a Walgreens and she cut me a deal that was just absolutely fabulous and I took bought all the white socks and walked out the door Holy and I gave those all the way by the end of the night oh so, that's awesome. New Orleans, I would have I would have been scared. <laughs> well, that's what people said to me. I was too yeah. naive to be scared, so <laughs> it was just a start for me. <laughs> yeah, well, it, did it, did, was, was any of those fears justified? Nope. No, it was just speculation. It's just perception of what people have in their mind about New Orleans. Right. It, it, nothing so far in my life, I have not had anybody come up to me and act like what people think the homeless represent. I mean, it's just, they're wonderful people. They're just either down on their luck. People are like, well, they're drug addicts and alcoholics. Some may be, but you gotta look at their situation. If I was lost my job, lost my house, lost my family, I might start drinking. <laughs> and then eventually that rolls into, you know? Yeah. So, and I mean, having a having an addiction or a problem doesn't make you a bad person. It actually makes you a person in a much worse situation. Right. So I wish more people would take the time to look at them because they that's really all they want is someone to commune, talk to them, and treat them with respect. I just left a group in downtown Tucson that I just really like, and that's all they were talking about. They said, I hate when people walk by me and they're looking away from me or they're looking down, and I'm not flying a kite and asking for anything. I'm just sitting there. I just would like someone to say, how's your day go? Yeah, I, I think I think in our world today, even someone like me that's, you know, maybe dressed clean, not homeless, people treat me that way too, you know, but... It's still nice to get some kind of eye contact and knowledge, you know, acknowledgement. Yes, so. I want to know I'm alive. So you've been to 25 states, half the states in the Union. And how many socks do you estimate? 32,000 pair, over. 32,000 pairs of socks. <laughs> oh, wow. Good job. So, good job. So you can't pay to get that kind of help. <laughs> you know? In all reality. I'm assuming your faith has a lot to do with it. Huh? It, does. it has strengthened my faith. I mean, I thought I was pretty religious and faith. I mean, I think I'm a great Christian, not really a religion. So okay. I'm a Christian, and I believe that the Lord takes care of all of us. And uh, it's just gotten stronger and stronger. Uh, 2009, 2010 was a nightmare for me. 2009, my house flooded. 2009, my house burned down. 2010, uh, my wife was murdered. And that was, uh, that was 2000. <laughs> it was a really bad couple of years, wow. And, and is this, was this uh, in the Chicago area? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, you know, suburbs, but yes. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, I, I'm sorry to hear about that rough year, man. That's, 
It was crazy. Um, when, what inspired you to be the, the sock man? You've been called the sock man because you go out and you hand out new socks to the homeless people, different um, homeless people. What, what inspired you to do this? I, I, the retirement and all the things that happened, I felt like uh, I was being touched on the shoulder and I, there was more for me to do after I got out of teaching. And the first six months of retired teaching, I wasn't too sure how I felt about it. And then I said I had to do more, and whatever reason, the sock man came to me, and I started. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Did having those tragic years kind of have anything to do with that? Yeah, they had a lot to do with it. I just, you know, I felt that there was more than just collecting items. Um, when my house burned down, I was uh, the collector of my family of the heirlooms, so we lost everything. But then I started to realize, you know, it's just items, and that's when my whole light bulb came on. I was like, they're items. I don't need to have more, so I got less. I, you know, they had the house rebuilt. I lost my shirt on it because of the flood. They, they said it's really not sellable, and I should have never built on the same spot, but I did. So I had to short sale it, and I bought myself an RV and decided, let's go for it. And, and then you, you mentioned that you, you, you stopped and see people you knew in Tucson. Yes. There's, I actually call them friends. They, when they see me, they get all excited, and they go, Mary saw me. I was going into the woods, and all these men were kind of looking, and Mary goes, oh, that's my sock man buddy. She ran over, gave me a big hug, and then she introduced me to some new people, and... You know, it's, that's the type of thing that, that I'm starting to build is people are starting to realize who I am. Whether I'm here, it seems like the word is kind of traveling to different places and people are like, yeah, have you ever heard about that guy that gives out socks? I go, that's me. And then I'll pull my bag off and say, yeah, you want socks? And, oh, and I left Mary just a little while ago. She goes, oh, I just love when you bring new socks. And she goes, I do have a suggestion. I said, what is that? She goes, you know, next time you come or when you're thinking about other things to do, we need underwear and toilet paper. Those are the three really, to me, those were the three important things. So I'm going to pick up some rolls and go back and see Mary and say, hey, here you are. And that's what I've heard a couple of times. And I said, well, how do you really get a size? And they said, just by medium and large. And then... Just like regular braids yeah, probably could work for anybody. Right. So I said, okay, I'll start doing that. There's an idea. I've never been in that situation where I've had the same pair of socks for more than a week. Without choice, you right. know. Right. You know, but can you, I can't even imagine wearing a pair of the same socks or not having socks for months. And I have seen some real bad feet. I mean, I've actually had people change their shoes. One girl in New Orleans asked me if I wanted to take her socks off. And I... <laughs> I passed on it because she had such boot rot on her feet. I mean, she hadn't been able to change her socks in six months. So can you imagine every day your feet sweating and for six months? She was so excited about getting new socks. <laughs> This year, are you following the Blackhawks this year? Is that what, is that how you, I know you saw Blackhawks game last night. Right? I am a Blackhawks fanatic. We own, uh, there's six teachers and a buddy of mine and I buy into that group. And so we have season tickets and then we all rotate the games or draw out of the hat. So it's been hard this year because I've left Chicago during the winter to start doing out here, so I haven't been able to go to games, but I follow them religiously. I'm a, I listen to them on the radio. I can't get to a TV. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. They're my team. That's awesome. I have my I have my Blackhawks feathers. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, hey, I, I should get a may I get a picture of that? Sure. Okay. So you went down to New Orleans, and then where did you go? New Orleans, and then uh, I went to Memphis, did the old Memphis trip, went to Nashville, then went down to Alabama, uh, in Louisiana, I met this 
fabulous woman, and she's married, and she took me to the LSU Alabama game, and we became super friends. Her, her husband and her daughter, her daughter went back to her school and raised socks for me, so they gave me those, and then the next year I was invited back, I went to the LSU game to see Johnny Football at uh, Texas A&M, and then I went from there to a woman in Alabama who took me in and stayed there for a week. She showed me around different places. And I had never known. She brought me to a restaurant that was actually called Porky's. <laughs> oh, like after the movie, Porky's. Oh, wow. So that's what has happened. I've actually <coughs> become friends of people that where I go, I can call them and say, hey, I'm in town. Uh, like there's a girl in Phoenix, Michelle, who has really taught me a ton about homeless, and she is just very knowledgeable about the law. We always connect up. And she, is she challenging the law out there? Oh, or? yes. Oh, yes. She's so knowledgeable, and she's out giving the homeless, this is where you go for this, and then she's actually going in and representing me. She's not a lawyer, but she'll go in and talk. Oh, on their behalf. Yeah, that's a lot of times with homeless, it's kind of like with the autistic kids where they communicate just fine. It's just... You have to communicate, you know, in the style that they communicate, and then you can communicate with them just like anybody else. Right. You know, but it, it, they have a, I can imagine, in court, though, you have to conform to the rules of the court and the, you know, terminology and everything else. So She has just opened up a whole new world for me. I just really enjoy getting together with her and sitting down and looking for land where we can get people to, to live without being thrown off or hassled and just a plethora of information. Well that's one of the one of the things that I don't think people realize. It's illegal to be homeless in most places. I, I should have worn my shirt, I made a shirt that says homeless is, is not a crime. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean that's a, a great statement because they can't sleep here in the park. I mean, look at this. Might be pretty decent, you know. Be awesome. Yeah, but sure, if if, if so they get reported, you got to get off the phone. Well, where do you go? You got a lot of times the homeless hide in these dry washes. Right, and that's where I'm at right now. Uh, on Lowell Street, I, I've been walking the wash, the gulch for miles. I walked 14 miles the other day and just found tons of people in that, in that area. Yeah. So, being so active, is this good for your health? Oh, yes. I, 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 in fact, I've tried to talk to some of my friends to get these because I said, you know, guys, this really motivates me. I mean, we're 63, and I'm like, you know, if you want to get in better shape. Going out and helping the homeless workout plan. <laughs> you know, walking through Washington and going all over the place. <laughs> uh, that has helped a lot. Walking in the sand is... Uh, Oh, yeah. <laughs> I never, yeah. never realized how tough it was. Oh, yeah. And in the washes, there were a lot of things I've never... I'm learning a lot, too. I mean, I have a dog named Charlie who travels with me. Traveling with Charlie, you know, from yeah. Steinbeck. <laughs> and uh, when we were walking through the washes, we had... I let him... He's really never been leashed. I let him go. And so we had three coyotes tracking us the other day. That was kind of nerve-wracking. And I'm like, well... I'm not really an outdoorsman, and I'm not sure what's going to happen. Yeah, no, and they, they, uh, they just, they leave you alone. I, you know, I found that out of work. I, every day, even the... Because you're out surveying them with a first-hand experience. You know, while other people are looking at charts and facts and figures and what someone else tells them. You know, so I would definitely think that you were you were more on hands and maybe a little more knowledgeable in what's going on. I appreciate that. Well, I mean, who am I, what am I going to listen to? Am I going to listen to what you say or am I going to listen to a statistic at the federal government? Well, and that's what I hope people listen to is they say, no. Let's talk to the guy that's out there walking the street. Yeah, it makes, it makes more logical sense. I mean, uh, do you think uh, addiction, uh, any kind of addiction, whether it's drug or alcohol or whatever, 
Is that a, 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 a factor for maybe choosing to be homeless? I mean, obviously, if I got a job, I can afford an addiction. But a lot of times, the addiction can get so bad where it does kind of disable you into being able to maintain a job. Or and I, yes, there is that population, but I... Again, by my experience, and I'm not a professional, oh, I no. would say it would be under 10% okay. to me. Um, you know, there are people, and people say to me all the time, or they yell out of the car while you're talking to them, they're like, you know, get a job. And a lot of these people can't get jobs. I mean, the market today is awful. And then you look at, okay, where are they going to get a shower? Where are they going to get nice clothes? They don't have a resume. A lot of them don't have social security cards. They don't have identification. They have four or five things against them already. Where are they going to go? And yes, there are places. There's a place in Phoenix called Justice Center. It's for 55 and older, and they do just a fabulous job. They bring in all the services to their building so these guys don't have to go out, you know, because a lot of places will say, well, if you go two miles down that way and take a right, you can get to that service, but then you have to go three miles that way to get to that service. Well, by the time they walk out the door, they've lost where they have to go. And it's, and it's sad because a lot of times uh, homeless people and people that don't have anything can be a cash cow. You know, like a, like the prison system or something, you know, to an aspect where um, we can get this guy on meds and we can get him on services and we can get him on this. That homeless person who doesn't have a job can generate more money than me working 40 hours a week for the system or, you know, the, of, of consumerism and this kind of money. Right, let's keep him there. And, and, it, and it's sad. Uh, I think that's part of one of the things that I battle with because I've looked at, you know, they're on food stamps, people who are on all of, they want to keep them there because if they get off, it's, they're losing money. But if they keep them there, yeah. so that's our goal. Let's keep yeah, it. Yeah, and then, and then the money keeps coming in for me. Right. And, but they're the ones that really need it. And they're not, they're not promoting them to live minimally. <laughs> no, no. You know, and, and it's... Yeah, it's, and to get people to understand what you know from your own experience is hard because they equate all that stuff as helping. That's what's helping the homeless. Right. And, and, and it, it's almost disabling them because if you did want to get out of it, you can't. Like I Rather than just kicking them out, why don't we get together, which is I think what Safe Park and that whole area tried to do was let's talk this out. You don't want to lose your business, but we need a place to stay. So why don't we come together and kind of work something out? We don't have to be in front of your business, but because we have no place else to go, we choose to live here. I used to go into the police departments and ask where the homeless used to stay. And there were a couple times they were offended that one, I was enabling them by giving them socks. They wanted them out of there. So they didn't share, and I'm not going to say which states. Yeah, it does it. Not all police are bad. It's, it's just like people. Not, a, not any group of people are all bad. So I've uh, decided to actually I'll go into Walmarts. Or, and they, a lot of those people know where they're at. And they'll say, I'll go over here. And then once I find one homeless person, I'll ask. And they don't give up the information real quickly until they get comfortable with it. They feel like they're, you know, they got their buddies out there that don't want to be found. And that's who I look for the most, you know, people that don't want to be found. The most secluded. Yeah, because they're usually the ones that need it the most. They're just trying to be independent and not bother anybody. Right. And that's what I look for. Now, a lot of my friends say, well, why don't you just go to big cities and go to, you know, all these places that have churches that you can drop a thousand pairs off. And I said, I have done that, and I do do that. But I look for the people that are living in the sewers, living in places where nobody wants the, to go. The people that don't fit into the system. Right. Four years of traveling around, even in your area. Um, what What is your assessment, your uh, survey 
of the homeless population? Is it is it getting bigger? Is it? Oh, it's. I don't care what anybody says. I know people. I have made comments on Facebook, and people will say, "Well, you know, I work for this organization, and we realize that the homeless are going, the population is going down." And I'm like, "Well, according to what I see out here, it's growing leaps and bounds." I mean, the number one. And number two thing, which I think are tied, are women vets coming back and families now. I mean, mothers with two, three kids. And And then I've met some people that, you know, have applied and and the vets, it takes so long for them to get in to see someone. You know, people say, well, there's no PTSD. Well, yeah, there is. They say no PTSD. I don't don't understand. Some people say there is no. Oh, it's a fictitious thing. So there was no shell shock. There was no. It's. It sounds like denial. Well, it's you know if you really look at it, it's real strange. You go to war. All your friends stay here in the United States, so their lives continue. Well, your lives continue, but at a whole different level and whole different rate. And then they expect you to come back and fit in. And your friends are still talking about, you know, let's get drunk, let's go to this party, let's go to this park. And you're sitting there thinking, I was just killing people two days ago, and they want me to just throw that all away and go someplace. Yeah, and pretend, pretend there isn't a problem. problem. Right. So and they don't, and they don't give you like emotional boot camp either. You no, know? no. And that was the big thing that I looked at, you know, in World War Two, and thank God those. Veterans did what they did, but it was six months from the time they got in the ocean to get back to the United States. So they had six months basically to settle down, get whatever they needed out of their system. Well, now you're in the war. 24 hours later, you're back here. Okay, (laughs) now what do I do? Yeah, yeah. So there's no decompression time. Yeah, it's a shame. Um, Oh, wait. Taking care of homeless <laughs> veterans. We no longer have any more homeless veterans. We got two waiting to get in houses and problem solved. What do you think of that? <laughs> I've heard that a lot from places. Yeah. The we, Phoenix we said the same thing yeah. a few years ago. We don't have vets. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm not buying that at all. One, some of the vets don't, they've tried to do the right way and have given up. They're like, you know, it just didn't work took us so long to get in some place. In fact, some vets have actually died waiting to get in to see a doctor. And one woman, and it was a story I had read, her husband died of cancer, and they wrote her a letter and said, hey, we'll see your husband now. Now, he had been dead for two years. They didn't even know that he had died. And they sent her a letter saying, he can come to see the doctor now. But there's something wrong here if, if you don't know those. Yeah. So. You know, we're so the vets are so far behind. I, I don't know what's going on. And yes, they are doing good for a lot of us. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to to say that they're not, because right. I'm sure they are, to a point. But there definitely is a good and a bad side to things. And it seems like too often people want to say, "Look at the good side. Oh, it's all fixed." You know, like last night, my intention was not to be little prince it was to say look what we did as a as an actual world i mean yes he was an awesome everything but we're ignoring the fact that 22 soldiers every day there's no light on that i don't see the white house turning their lights on you know i I see them ignoring their problem more than anything what's your biggest thing people need to communicate to the homeless realize they're human beings. They want love. They want to be hugged. They want to be touched. In fact, I did have one guy. I can't remember his name, and I can't even remember the state. But as I was walking away, he looked at me and he said, Thank you for giving me a hug. This is the only contact I'm going to have all day. And that broke my heart. I mean, it made me feel good, but it broke my heart to think that this guy was longing just to be touched. Yeah. 
I know, it's just, just the basic stuff that people take for granted. A haircut! Right. For my own life, after doing all of this, watching people, I started really getting into minimalism. And uh, I watched a TED Talk, and this girl challenged to see if you could live with under a hundred items. So I'm down to 200 items of what I own. I and have. so is this more rewarding to live this way minimally than going out and trying to get fancy things and more bigger? It has for me, it's worked out well. I mean, I know people say, you know, they go in and they go, oh, I have nothing to wear and they might have a closet full of clothes. Well, it's hard to pick that. But when you have three dress shirts, three pairs of pants, three t-shirts. Your choice is, yes, I'll wear this today. <laughs> it's, it's real quick. And, and, and items like when you have to move, oh boy, you don't know how much crap that you don't need until you have to actually box it up. And that's, I've been talking to my friends about it, then they're laughing, but I do have one buddy that's going to try it. I was over there helping him the other day, and he goes, but this bike, I mean, this bike was a beat up, the tires were gone, the seat was worn out. He goes, yeah, but I've, I've had this for 11 years. I've ridden thousands of miles on this. I just can't get rid of it. I said, take a picture of it and then throw the bike away. You'll always have the picture. But, <laughs> but he couldn't part with it yet. <laughs> yeah, well, it sounds like the feet might have been a better ride. <laughs> Holy cow, yeah. So it's been, it's been fun. I've learned a lot that way, too. I, I realized that there's a lot of things that I don't need that I thought I had to have. I just started giving it away. I've given a lot to the homeless. And, you know, things that I haven't looked at in a year. I'll go someplace and go, I've never used anything in this drill. Clean it out, give it away. <laughs> and, and this buddy of mine says, well, what if I don't? What if? What if hasn't happened in this past year? I doubt it's going to happen. Yeah, that's a lot of times I look at stuff. No, I haven't used this in five years. What am I going to do with it? Give it to someone that might really like it. It's like, hey, well, gone. And then, it, and then you don't have to carry that weight around with you. And I'm, I'm sure, and I see, you probably see a lot of people living in the I do. Taking that that good positive impact in the world and you're planting seeds everywhere and you're finding that it's growing. That was my intention and I have had people say to me all the time, why don't you just stay in one area? And my comment back to them is my goal is to touch the homeless heart, but my goal is to have the town, city, village notice that man, there's something being done, maybe we should join in. And I feel like it's starting to grow, and that's my goal, is make everybody aware of it. So it's also changed your perspective in the last four years of how life really is. Right, right. right. And wow. I am thankful every day I get up and I go, wow, I get to do this again, and you know, it's, it's very rewarding. And I, and I learn a lot every day. Well, it, it isn't that what what uh, what you should do as a teacher? You know, you spend your life teaching everybody else, and now you you take the time out for yourself and uh, learning in life. That I am. It's been great. Just by passing out socks. Who knows? Who knows what it'll grow into? Right, right. That's what people say a lot. Some of the homeless go, I think I should. Will you autograph my sock? And I laugh like, you're going to become famous. Like, oh, that's not the goal here. So I don't think so. So I don't need to autograph. I wish these issues did become famous. You know, I wish they really did. I wish, yeah, the, the issues, that would be awesome. I think that that would be, you know, if we could get rid of, even if we got rid of 80% of the homeless or situations that are so bad, well, can you can, can you imagine one out of five, one out of ten people? If one out of ten people would help, you know, do something in their community, they cared. 
Well, I have, uh, like I said, I suggest to my friends and, and that group, a lot of my friends have taken to the fact that they'll carry a uh, 12-pack of socks in their car. Some are now making little baggies of, you know, a toothbrush, shampoo, socks, maybe a dollar in there. And when they see someone standing there going up a ramp, they see it, they go, here you go. So um, I'm excited to see that they're getting involved. Yeah. And you know that if it sucks, they're going to use it to something they need. It's not going to go to cigarettes or something else. Right. You know, that's... And people, uh, one thing that people always ask me about is, I go, well, do you give them money? And I said, I do. I started the sock thing so I wouldn't have to, but over time I've also realized that it doesn't matter to me what they use the money for. If they need cigarettes or they need alcohol, how do I know the guy's not in the DTs? And yeah, yeah. By me giving him his $5 and him going in there, might save his life. I don't know, and I'm not going to make that judgment. Well, it's not me. I'm not, I'm yeah. not here to make judgment. Yeah, well, and I think that's what we all should be on a personal level. And correct me if I'm wrong, because it's your perspective, that this has been just the... The neatest little adventure. It has turned into the best thing that has ever happened to me personally. My mother-in-law said, you always wanted to travel, and now you're actually doing it. And she goes, and what you're doing is so awesome. She goes, I, I'm so happy for you. You're living your dream. I said, I am. That's awesome. I'm happy for you.